I'm laying on the operating table. There's these two devices in my eyes to keep them wide open so I can't blink. And the doctor is over me putting this big machine over my eye in order to shoot a laser into it to correct my vision. And as he's adjusting it and about to hit the button to have the laser shoot into my eye, he says, so what do you do for a living? I'm laying there, kind of freaked out. Without thinking, I said, I'm a Catholic priest. Silence. I think, oh no. Does he have a problem with the church? Is there going to be an issue? Is he going to hold the button a little too long? Am I never going to see again? He hits the button, the laser shoots into my eyes. I can't see anything. And, you know, 10 seconds later, all of a sudden, I can see. He takes the machine off that eye and puts it onto my left eye. And he says, have you ever read this book about church history? And then starts naming this book. And next thing you know, we're having a whole conversation about how the church has shaped the, the Western world and about Jesus and everything else as he shoots a laser into my next eye. And the only reason I'm laying on this table having LASIK surgery done was because about three years ago, a friend of mine, he had it done and he was telling me, you have to do it. It's the best money I ever spent. And I was like, oh, okay, maybe one day. And then a year later, another friend did it. And I was like, oh, maybe another dime. And then last year, my brother did it. And then to tell you the truth, it's because I ran out of contacts. And either I was going to have to go to the eye doctor or I was going to go get the surgery done so I would never have to wear contacts again. And there I am laying on the operating table. Well, 24 hours later, I'm actually out to eat for dinner with my sisters. And I'm telling Aaron, Aaron, you have to get this LASIK surgery. It's the best money I've ever spent in my life. And two weeks later, I'm driving her to Chicago so she can have the surgery done. There's something about trying new things or doing new things in life, whether big or small, whether it's going to a new restaurant. I don't know about you, but I usually never go to a new restaurant unless if somebody else has told me about it. You know, let them try it out first. And then our friends, our, our spouse, whoever it is. In one sense, that is one of the reasons why we're here, and that is the reason why we have Simon Peter encountering Jesus. I love the gospel today that the deacon read. We're actually, it's the first chapter of the gospel of John. I just want to read a section of it because Simon Peter, you know, the first pope, he wasn't the first one to encounter Jesus. He wasn't even the one that said, oh, there he is, I'm going to go follow him. Rather here, listen, it's about Andrew. It says, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter was one of the two who heard John the Baptist and followed Jesus. He first heard, he heard John and followed Jesus. He first found his own brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah. Then he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You'll be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. Andrew goes, gets his brother Simon Peter, gets his brother and says, I found the Messiah. I found the one that is going to give meaning to our lives. I found the one whom is going to change everything. The one that the scriptures are talking about. Come and see. Come and find out. And he comes with his brother Andrew and encounters him. And what I'm going to term is we all need Andrews in our life. We all need those people who are going to go and encounter the Lord. And we have all have them. That's the reason why we're sitting here. But then we have to be Andrew as well. We have to be willing to go and tell somebody else, I found the Lord. Let me tell you about him. We talk about all the time, we make disciples, or we are disciples who make disciples, which is another word for that, another term for the word that we all kind of hesitate around, evangelization, spreading the good news, telling others about Jesus. Really, it's about just being Andrew. And we've all experienced it. As many of you know, I, uh, I entered seminary. I was 18 years old. I just finished high school. And I entered seminary not to become a priest, rather I entered seminary to prove to myself and really to prove to God that I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not holy enough, I don't have the gifts necessary to be a priest. But there was this call I felt and this, this tugging on my heart during this time and I said, okay, I'm going to go to seminary, I'm going to be able to answer that question, I'm going to be able to prove to God and myself that this isn't for me and I can then leave and go do my own thing. Well, I finished the first year. And I still didn't have the question answered. I remember talking to my spiritual director and in prayer and thinking, I don't feel like I should be a priest yet. But at the same time, I still have this question that's gnawing at me. It's just driving me nuts in one sense. So I came back for a second year. And then a third year, a fourth year. 
And in my fifth year of seminary, I came back, and I still didn't have the answer. I still didn't know, am I supposed to do this? But I remember in that fifth year, I started thinking to myself, I'm three years away from getting ordained a priest. I need to figure this out. Either I'm going to stay on this trajectory and I'm going to be ordained a priest, or I'm going to get out and go and do my own thing. I'm going to go in a different direction, a different vocation. And it was the end of my fifth year. I remember leaving seminary and I had two questions that I felt like, God, I need you to answer these two. Like, this is what's holding me back. The first was, I needed to know that this life, being a priest, was going to bring me joy and happiness and fulfillment. I needed to know that. And the second one was I didn't want to lose my identity. Sounds kind of funny, but I didn't want to just become father. I wanted to be Father Declan and enjoy the things that I enjoy and have the gifts that I have and the struggles that I have and everything else, that it was still me. And so that summer after my fifth year of seminary, I was actually assigned to Father Jim Wozniak, who some of you may know, he was the associate pastor here a long time ago. And it was out in Crown Point at St. Matthias. And I was assigned there for the summer internship and... That summer, the first month, it became very clear, that first question about joy and happiness and fulfillment. It became very clear to me in doing ministry and in my prayer that this is who God created me to be. Like, this is right where God was putting me, and this is what I want. This is where I found fulfillment in my life. And I was able to just answer that question for myself. And then the second was about my identity. Every morning at 6 a.m., Father Jim and myself, we would sit on the front porch of the rectory. And we would have coffee for an hour and we would just talk about life, whether it's ministry and priesthood or sports or whatever else. But in those times, he showed me that he was still a very much Father Jim and the things he enjoyed to do and the gifts that he had and the weaknesses he had. It was who he was and he brought all that into the priesthood. And by the end of that summer, the question on my heart was no longer, should I be a priest or not? Rather, the question was, how was I going to be the best priest possible? when I went back into seminary, and then obviously three years later getting ordained a priest. But for me, Father Jim and the staff and the leaders at the parish was Andrew. They're the ones who helped show me, this is where the Lord is calling you. Follow him. And that's what the Lord is doing for each one of us, but then simultaneously, we need to be Andrew as well. What I love about the gospel, what I love about this, is it was in the first chapter of John. It was before Andrew saw any of the miracles take place. It was before Andrew saw Jesus raise people from the dead. It was before Andrew heard any of the teachings, really, of Jesus. Rather, it was right at the beginning, because so often we justify to ourselves, well, I don't know enough. I'm not a very good Christian as it is. I shouldn't be talking about this yet. I feel like a fraud. But Andrew shows us a different way, that we walk together on this path, that we come to know Jesus together as Andrew meets Andrew, or Andrew meets Peter. And so today, I want to give us three ways to change our thinking, okay? Are you guys with me still? I know it's cold. It's a little bit like, let's go and like, you know, get under a blanket and go to sleep by a fire, but like, we're going to be together for a little bit longer. So I want us to change our ways of thinking just a little. I want to give us three ways. The first is, we need to remember others always. We need to remember others always. Andrew encountered Jesus, and there must have been something so encapsulating about Jesus. Right? We hear Jesus walking by the shore of the Sea of Galilee and sees a couple of the disciples in the boat. He says, follow me, and they left everything and followed him. We hear how Jesus goes up to the customs post, to Matthew, who was collecting taxes, probably the one of the richest people in the town, and he says, follow me. And Matthew leaves everything behind to follow Jesus. There has to be something so encapsulating about Jesus. But in the midst of Andrew experiencing that, he remembers his brother, Peter. Remember others always. And he goes and says, Peter, I've found the Lord. But I think for us and our way of thinking is, really, it's about our own family. It's our friends. Those people closest to us are the ones that we need to be willing to talk about Jesus with, which is hard. It's awkward. I know. But isn't salvation worth the awkwardness? Isn't salvation worth that as we go forward? To be able to be like Andrew and go to Peter and says, I found the Lord. But if we think of others always, then second is, then we need to be ready to witness. We need to be ready to talk about it. Right? We need to be able to say why we're here. Like if somebody asks you right now, why are you in the church at 1030 on a Sunday when it's sub-zero outside? 
And maybe some of you, the answer is because I'm forced to be here. I feel forced or I am forced. And if that's the case, I want to invite you to tune out the rest of my homily if you do one thing. I just want you to do one thing and you tune out the rest of my homily. And that is to invite the Lord right now in prayer into your heart to help see the deeper reality of what God wants to do in your life. St. Francis of Assisi says, preach the gospel always and when necessary, use words. Brothers and sisters, it's necessary to use words. Remember others always and be ready to witness. The third, I just want to steal a quote directly from St. Ignatius of Loyola. He says, act as if everything depends upon you, but pray as if everything depends upon God. Act as if the whole world depends upon you. And we can feel that at times. The weight of the world, the pressures of this life, sitting on your shoulders and weighing you down. Act as if everything depends upon you. But simultaneously, pray, trusting that everything and knowing that everything depends upon God. Because in this life, it is not just God and it's not just you. Rather, it's us responding to God's grace and saying, yes, stepping into that space and be willing to trust So if we act as if everything depends upon us and pray as if everything depends upon God, it comes together in this beautiful way in which all of a sudden we show up and we are like Andrew. So if we remember others always, if we're ready to witness, and if we do that, act and work and and pray in that way, we'll be the disciples who make disciples. We'll be able to evangelize our family, our friends, those people closest to us to witness to the power of Jesus Christ. In other words, we'll be Andrew to those around us. Disciples, can I hear an amen?